Are you looking for a free and open source hypervisor with excellent support from multiple hosts, multiple clusters, and built-in backup support? Then XCPNG with Zen Orchestra might be what you're looking for. Today I'll show you how to install XCPNG, set up a local ZFS pool of house VMs, get Zen Orchestra installed, import some ISOs, set up a basic cloud init configuration for Linux templates, import an Ubuntu template, and create an Ubuntu server in Windows Server 2022 VM. So here we are at the first screen that you'll see once you boot into the install ISO. We're going to click OK. Then it's going to check for any pre-existing installations of XCPNG that it might be able to upgrade. We're going to go ahead and accept the EULA here. You can read about it on their website. We're going to do a clean install instead of upgrading an existing installation. Here you can see all the drives in your system that you could install XCPNG to. I'm going to install it to this SATA DOM. You could use Software RAID to do a mirrored install if you have two different boot medias. Here you would select where you're going to install your virtual machines to. I'm going to uncheck the SATA DOM for now. And then we're going to click continue on this warning. Our install source is going to be local. The repository is here on the ISO. We are going to verify the ISO install files just to make sure that everything is good. This will likely take a little while depending on the speed of your install media. I am mounted on IPMI, so it's a little bit slow for me. There were no issues, so we're going to go ahead and specify a root password now for the XCPNG install. And we're going to pick the management interface for the server. I'm going to use ETH0. Here you can configure your networking, either DHCP or static IP. I'm going to use static and enter the IP address as well as the subnet masking gateway that I want. If you are using tagged versus untagged VLANs here, you could use the use VLAN option and specify the VLAN number. Here we're going to configure hostname and DNS. So I've got my hostname Harbinger and my two DNS servers. These are internal and you could specify a third public one if you want. We're going to select our time zone. I'm in New York. I'm going to specify NTP. We're going to use pool.ntp.org. You could use up to three here. And then we're going to confirm that we do want to install XCPNG. This, just like the source verification, will take a little while, depending on the install media that you have. The reason earlier that I did not select any drives to install the virtual machines onto is that I will be doing a ZFS mirror on these four drives, so two mirrors of two SSDs each. I hit the wrong button here to confirm the reboot for the system, so I'm going to unmount the ISO manually from IPMI and then issue the reboot command on the command line. One thing that I am going to have to do here is boot into the BIOS and make some adjustments as to the boot order. XCPNG will install as a UEFI operating system if that's what you use. So as I said, I'm going to boot into my BIOS, go into my boot screen. You can see that I have dual boot mode selected. So I can use either UEFI or the old BIOS boot methods. I'm going to move my UEFI install of XCPNG up to the top. Second is going to be network. And then I'm going to use the EFI built-in shell as the third. Or fourth, rather. And then we're going to go ahead and save changes and reset. And the system will reboot now and attempt to boot into XCPNG, and we will see if we were successful. This is sped up a little bit, but it is relatively fast. If you're not booting on a server board, it'll be faster if you're using something like a consumer system. But regardless, it still doesn't take too, too long to get in. This is good news. We can see the Grub bootloader. It will automatically boot into XCPNG. And then we can see the system initialize startup. Here we can see the messages on the boot up and some information on DOM0, which XCPNG runs off of. Once the system boots, we're going to go ahead and SSH into the system and get ZFS installed. So here's the SSH. 
we're going to go ahead and yum install ZFS. I already installed it, so I'm going to get a little bit of an error here. Next, we're going to mod probe v ZFS so we can use the ZFS file system without having to reboot the server. This command here is long. What it is doing is listing all of the disks by IDs. This is a preferred, more resilient method of creating the ZFS pool as opposed to using the SD numbers on the drives. These are the actual IDs of the disk. I'm going to copy these down for the next command. So the next command is zpool create. So we're going to do zpool create to create the zpool. We're going to run dash O for options, A shift equals 12, dash M for the mount location, mount ZFS. We're going to create a pool called tank. The first part is going to be a mirror of those two drives. And then the second part is a mirror of the next two drives. Then we're going to go run a zpool status and we can see the status and a layout of our new pool tank. Mirror 0 and Mirror 1 comprised of the two different SSD groups we did in the previous command. Next, we're going to do XE host list to get the UUID of our Zen host. We're going to take this down for the next command that we need to run. We can also see the name of our host Harbinger here. Next, we're going to run an XE command, storage repository create on the host UUID that we just did type is going to be ZFS. We're going to create the label here. We're going to pipe it the location that it is, mount ZFS. Uh, the label and device config is actually duplicated here, but it doesn't matter. You don't need the extra two on the end. Next, we're going to set three different ZFS commands. ZFS set sync equal disabled for tank. We're going to enable LZ4 compression, and we're going to turn A time off. Next command I will run is XS console. Now we're going to go into the disks and storage repositories to see our ZFS pool. Now local ZFS, we can see 1.72 terabytes created and we can see the location on mount ZFS. I'm gonna go ahead and quit back to the shell here. And the next command we're going to run is going to increase the DOM zero memory allocation to 16 gigabytes. This is needed for smooth operation of ZFS. The next command we're going to run is going to pull the xo-vm-import sh script from Ranave's GitHub repository. This is going to download and import an OVA of a fully functional Deviant install with Zen Orchestra pre-configured. This is an excellent and easy option if you're looking to bootstrap just a single XCPNG host. It's going to ask which network interface you want to use and I wasn't entirely sure on this install which one I wanted to use so we can go back into XS console go into networking go into display Nix, and then page down to scroll down in my instance it's going to be eth3 connected to my 10 gig network so we can go back rerun that script we're going to pick the first option to install to our ZFS pool and then we're going to pick option 2 in my case to use the 10 gig network I'm going to hit enter to just use DHCP. And here you can see that it's downloading the XVA image. And once it's finished, it'll wait for the VM to spin up and then use the built in tools to get the IP address and then print out the login information. Which we can see right here 172.16.1.201. And the credentials for the UI and SSH are both here. So we're going to go ahead and switch over to Chrome and get logged into the address that it just gave us. Make sure you use the HTTPS. It will have a self-signed certificate, so you will have to accept this. Login credentials are admin at admin.net with a password of admin. And here is Zen Orchestra. First thing that we're going to go ahead and do is add our server. The label is what it'll be called. I use the host name, and then you can use the host name here or the IP address. Then I'm going to enter the root username, the password that we've selected during install, and this checkbox is going to enable on-sign certificates because we do not have a valid HTTPS certificate on the server. I'm going to go to home and hosts, and here's the host that we just added. I'm going to just change the lowercase h to an uppercase h. With XCPNG, when you create a new pool, the pool name is equal to the name of the first host that created it. So Harbinger, 
going to change the pool name to Harbinger also. We can see the DOM0 size is 16 gigs. Control domain memory is 16 gigs. You generally have to do a reboot for that to take effect. We can see some general information on the hardware of the system down here. My CPU type, any GPUs available. We can see that I have some patches that are ready to be installed. We'll click that and then we'll hit OK. Wait for those patches to get installed. We can go over to tasks in a second here and we can see what's going on as far as the update. The tool stack on the XCPNG host is being rebooted right now, so that's why the connection to the host has been lost. You can speed this up a little bit by going into settings, servers, disabling, and then re-enabling it. And you can see here that we are being prompted to reboot the server. I'm going to hit cancel here though and go into my VMs, then go to my Zen Orchestra VM, go to the advanced tab, and we're going to change some settings here. We're going to turn auto power on on as well as protect from accidental deletion. We do not actually need protect from accidental shutdown, so we'll turn that back off. Auto power on will make sure that the VM auto starts when the host starts, so that way there isn't an interruption to XOA. I'm going to hit reboot here and OK, and we're going to get an error because there is no host for that VM to get migrated to. So we will just have to shut the host down manually, or we could do force reboot. In my instance, I'm going to go to the console on Harbinger and just give it a reboot command. We will notice that the web interface will go down once that orchestra shuts down and it should come back up in a second here as the VM auto reboots when the host is back up. What we're going to do is I'm going to take a look at the new XOLite interface that is on the host itself. So we're going to copy the host IP address and go to https colon forward slash forward slash the IP address. Log in with root and then the root password. And here we can see XOLite. So we can see the VMs that are running, a console of the VM, some basic host information, most of the rest of this isn't built out except for the VMs, but you could stop and start the VM from this interface. So if you do find yourself without your Zen Orchestra, you could at least do some basic troubleshooting, turn the VM back on, diagnose a starting issue on the VM, but we're going to log out and go back to Zen Orchestra here. Let's go to Home and then Pools, and we're going to go to our Harbinger pool. We can see the note here that we do not have pro support. That's to be expected. We're going to go to network and then we're going to go ahead and we're going to change some of the names on the networks here. On ETH0, I'm going to go ahead and call this management network. One thing that's a little bit of an oddball is you can't delete these unused networks. So we're also going to change ETH3 to our production uplink. You can change the name on ETH1 and 2 if you don't use them to something like unused. Now we're going to go to advance, just look at the settings in here. You can see logs, patches, there's the network, statistics on different parts of the host. We're going to go to the host now instead of the pool, and we can see that those names have made their way downstream. You can see you actually can't delete the PIF because it is physical, PIF, physical interface. So now we're going to go to our storage. You can see our local ZFS storage in here, as well as the DVD drives, removable storage, and XCPNG tools. We're going to just leave all of this connected. We can go into our local ZFS, see stats see disks that are on it, see hosts it's attached to, any logs that might be present. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go to new storage and we're going to create a local ISO repository on our ZFS storage. So I'm going to put all of this information in, a name, a description, storage type is going to be local, and then I'm going to type a path in for it. One thing that will happen is because I put the cart before the horse on this one and did not create the local file path. It is going to give me an error here when I hit create. So we're going to go to home, hosts, and open that in a new tab. Then we're going to go to harbinger. We're going to go to console. And we're going to go ahead and log in. You notice we've been logged out because the host was rebooted. 
So we're going to go ahead and CD into mount ZFS. And we're going to do an LS to see what's in here. You don't actually need to do this uh, change directly that I'm about to do here. Because we're just going to go back into ZFS. And then we're going to run a makedir isos folder in here. And that should be all we need to do. We can go back to the other tab here and hit create. We don't have to change anything else. Now that the path exists, it'll happily create it. Now that the ISO storage is created, we're going to want to upload a new ISO to it. We're going to go to import disk, select our ISO storage, and we can drop an ISO here. I'm going to drop the server 2022 installation ISO here. Windows Server 2022 is going to be my description. I'm going to hit import. This will take a little while. You can also use an SMB store if you want to, but for the purpose of this video, I wanted it to be relatively self-contained. So the import is finished. That can take a little while. Next, I'm going to go ahead and go to home and then templates, and we're going to look and see that there is a server 2022 template here. We can click on that little expander and we can see that the default is two cores and two gigs of RAM. Anything with those little underlying dashes means you can edit it if you click it to change the defaults for this template. The next thing we're going to do is we're going to go to pools, harbinger, network, and we're going to set production uplink to automatic. So it'll be added for all new VMs as the network interface. We're also going to set local ZFS as our primary default storage. So we're going to go to storage for that and set as the default SR. The next thing we want to do is we want to go ahead and create an Ubuntu 2004 template. So we're going to do a Google search for Ubuntu 2004 cloud image. Go to the Ubuntu cloud images website. And we're going to go ahead and we're going to use focal. And then we're going to go to current and we're going to find the OVA. And what we're going to do actually is import this OVA into Zen Orchestra as a VM and then convert it into a template so that we, we can clone it and modify it later using cloud in it. This will allow us to spin up new Ubuntu VMs very quickly and also in a repeated manner without having to do a bunch of manual changes in between clones as you would on a normal cloning method. So we're going to go to import on our XOA and we're going to import VM. We're going to do it to Harbinger local ZFS. Once the OVA finishes installing, we're going to import it. We're going to change the name here. We're going to call it Ubuntu Server 2004 Cloud Image. I'm going to set a description. We're going to go ahead and call this Cloud Init Ready Ubuntu Server 2004. CPUs in memory, we can leave the same for the moment. I'm going to call disk zero boot so we know what it is. And I'm going to go ahead and change the network to production uplink and we're going to hit import. Again, this will take a little while. It should be relatively quick because the file is small and it's uploading over the network. And what this did is it imported the full VM. So this is actually a virtual machine. We're going to go ahead and go to advanced and we're going to convert this to a template. So that way we can use this as a VM base going forward. This has all of the software installed to utilize cloud in it to be able to template this VM. So we're going to go to settings and cloud config, and we're going to go ahead and create a cloud in it template here. The name will just be a bunch of cloud config. And for the network, we're going to just call this any network DHCP since it'll pull DHCP from well, any network. I built this cloud config off to the side. It's going to be posted on the blog so you can get a little bit of a better look. But effectively, it's going to use the VM name as the host name, set the time zone, set some default users, import SSH keys, update all the packages, go ahead and install the Zen guest utilities as well as reboot the server. And this is just going to pull DHCP on the primary Ethernet interface and it's going to just say true. We're going to hit create on both of those, and then we're going to go to create new VM on Harbinger. We're going to select the Ubuntu template we created earlier. We're going to call this cloudy. We're going to just give it a description. Cloud in a demo. We're going to up the RAM to two. 
in install settings, we're going to do a custom config. We're going to pick our default config and our DHCP. We're also going to increase the size of the boot drive from 10 gigs to 64 gigs. And due to the software that's installed in the template, it's going to go ahead and grow that file system to that 64 gigs once it's installed. We can see the VM booting up. And if we go to the console, we can watch the progress of this. This will take a little while to complete and we'll reboot a couple of times, but we can see the name is cloudy. That's a good sign. We can see we have no IPv4 record, OS information, or management agent detected. There it is. So the management agent did get installed. So we see the version number, the IP address, as well as some information as to the OS that the VM is running. We can see that the console has rebooted. That means we are maybe good to go. Let's see if we can log in. Except in this instance, I don't believe I set the cloud in it to allow me to log in locally, and I believe we're forced to use SSH. So we're going to go to general, and oh, there's no IP address yet. So we're not quite ready to call this install done yet. We have a couple more minutes. Oh, there's our IP address. So we're going to go ahead and SSH into that guy. Double check on the console just to make that th sure that things are good. And then we're going to go ahead and open up PuTTY and SSH into this VM with the IP address we grabbed a second ago. We're going to go ahead and run LSBLK just to confirm that we did grow the partition to 64 gigs from that 10 gig. We'll also do an apt update and apt upgrade just to confirm that there are no packages to upgrade uh, because they should have been done already during init, which they were. And now we can pretty much just go ahead and shut this VM down. From here, normally, you'd go ahead and install whatever software that you would want to install since the VM is ready to be utilized. So we're going to go ahead and shut this down and head back over to Zen Orchestra now. And we're going to build out our Windows VM. So we're going to create a new VM. We're going to go ahead and select our server 2022 template. We're going to go ahead and give it a name, just demo VM. We're going to increase the RAM a little bit here from 2 to 4 gigs. Select an ISO, server 2022. And we're going to select our production uplink. Make sure our SR is selected. We're going to go ahead and set the drive to 64 gigs. You can see some advanced settings down here if you want to look at that. There are some different options in here as far as creating multiple VMs. We are going to turn secure boot on on here. And then we're going to go ahead and hit create. So we're going to go over to console. And when the Tiano core boot is showing, we're going to hit delete to boot into the BIOS. And we're going to go ahead and increase the resolution of this VM's console up to something a little bit more sensible, like 1600 by 900. We're going to go ahead and commit. And then we're going to go to reset. And we'll go ahead and reboot this VM now. And instead of having this small little window, we'll have something a little bit larger to work with. This isn't strictly necessary, but it makes my life a little bit easier during install and troubleshooting. So we're going to go ahead and boot into the Windows install ISO now. You can see it loading. We're going to go ahead and click Next. Install now. If you've ever installed server before, this will look pretty familiar. It's the same process as any other type of install. We're going to select 2022 data center desktop experience. We're going to accept the terms and conditions and we're going to do a custom install, pick our drive. This is going to take a little while. It's usually pretty quick, especially on this ZFS install with all the SSDs. There the VM did the reboot for the server install. And we're going to get prompted to enter our password. So we're going to go ahead and do that. And it will be dumped to the login screen. So we can issue a control out delete. Log in with the credentials we just input. And the first thing we're going to go ahead and do on this VM is we're going to go ahead and install the management agent. You can install the one from XCPNG's parent company Vates, they maintain one, or you can use the Citrix one. In this case, I'm going to use Citrix's management agent because it's got more performant drivers.
With that, there are actually a couple ways in advanced. You could do Windows Update Tools, and it should hypothetically pull the tools down from Windows Updates. Sometimes I have good success with this, sometimes I don't. It kind of all depends. So usually I just go with the Management Agent MSI. So we're going to go ahead and ignore the Windows Admin. We're going to go ahead and make sure Server Manager doesn't pop up every time we log in and exit that out. I've already downloaded the management tools here. So we're going to extract the zip file and then we're going to go ahead and install the 64-bit management agent. Click next. We're going to take a snapshot here just in case something weird happens. You can see how quick that is. We're going to accept that defaults here. We're going to wall accept and we're going to go ahead and install that. This takes a minute and then it'll prompt you for a reboot so that way you can finish installing all of the drivers. This will take a second just because of the Citrix VM tools agent. As you can see, we did not have any tools detected or installed, so we didn't have any information or insight as to the type of operating system the VM is running or the IP address of the interfaces. Normal reboots don't take that long. It's just because the tools were installed. So now it's coming back up and then we can boot back into Windows. And if we go back to general, we can see that we have our management agent detected, the IP address, and the install picture of Windows in the, over there in the corner to tell us that we're running Windows. We're gonna log back in now. We can see that the tools were installed successfully. And if we go into device manager, we can see a couple of things in here. I'm also going to pull up the interface and we can see that it is a 100 gig network interface on the Zen server PV drivers. And if I go into our device manager, we can see all of the Zen drivers that are installed. Now I'm going to go ahead and right click on the start button. And we're going to go to apps and features and we're just going to go double check the version of the management agent that we have installed. We can see it's 9.3 from Citrix. Next thing I'm going to want to do is do some very quick disk performance testing using Crystal Disk Mark. So I'm going to go ahead and download that now and then we'll go ahead and get some tests run just to see how performant this array is with these SSD. I will note they're not NVMe drives or anything like that. They're standard SATA SSDs. Though with that said, our read is pretty much what we would expect. Running a RAID 1, we are doubling our read speed from our SATA SSDs, and the ZFS cache is probably helping out here too. So we're about double what I would expect from a single SATA SSD, actually a little bit more than that. But like I said, that could be down to the ZFS file system, helping the read speeds out quite a bit here. So we'll go ahead and give this a second to move over to the right. We've got 775, so that's not super great, but there are some under the hood improvements that still need to be done to XCPNG on the storage side. So that's about what I would expect to see reasonably as far as the storage speeds go. It's still respectable, it's just maybe a touch slower compared to what you might see from something like Proxmox or VMware. So now that the test is complete, we're going to switch over to IOPS. We can see just about 39,000 IOPS read and 18,800 IOPS write. Still really not bad. Definitely much faster than if we were using a hard drive array. So with that performance testing done, let's go ahead and take a little bit more of a look at the Zen Orchestra interface. We can see our options in Home, Dashboard, Backup. We're going to go to settings and we're going to go to plugins and look at all of the available plugins that we have. So we can see a bunch of different authentication plugins for GitHub, Google, LDAP, SAML. We also have backup reports, load balancer, netbox, performance alerts, SDN controllers, email alerting, Nagios alerting, Slack, usage reports, webhooks. Now we're going to go ahead and go to our users to see how that looks. Then you've got your groups. You've got your access control lists in case you want to provide some restrictions as to your users. You can limit things like VMs, pools, storage, networks, 
Now we're going to go to our remotes, which is file systems that you use for things like backups. Then we can go down here to our cloud configs and we can see the configurations that we did earlier on the right hand side. You hit the edit button and it pulls them in to be edited. Then down here we can click on our user and we can see things like where we would change our password. We can also add our SSH keys in here if we wanted to go ahead and put in an SSH key that we might normally use. That's just some garbage info. You can also see API tokens. And if we go here, we can go ahead and see what's under new, VM, storage, network, and server. We're gonna go ahead and create a new VLAN network. So we're gonna create a network on Harbinger on our 10 gig interface. I'm gonna go ahead and call this demo VLAN with a description of VLAN 10. MTU will leave default. VLAN will put in our VLAN ID, which is 10. So now you can see we have a VLAN 10 interface on Harbinger. This would be added to all hosts in the pool. This is a good method to access something like a storage VLAN where you might have an NFS share specifically on a dedicated network. And you can see if we go to Harbinger that we have the demo VLAN. If we want to add an IP address, you can go ahead and click on mode, move to DHCP. Again, you see those little dashes or dots underneath the text to indicate that it's a click option. So you can go ahead and choose a setting from there. Give it a second to go ahead and pull a DHCP address. And once it does, we should see the IP address that it pulled. It was disconnected, so we're going to go ahead and connect it. You can see the network speed for the production uplink and the demo VLAN are both 10 gigs. The demo VLAN hangs off of production uplink, so that makes sense. One thing I do realize at this point is that I don't have VLAN 10 tagged on the uplink port, so it won't work. So from here, we can go and click on home and go to storage. We can see all of our different storage repositories. And if we go to dashboard overview, we can see a bunch of information as to what's going on in our Zen Orchestra. Number of pools, number of hosts, number of VMs, RAM usage, CPU usage, storage usage, any alarms, any pending tasks, number of users added to the instance, storage repository use, as well as VM power state. Like I said, this is for the entire Zen Orchestra. You can drill down on the top to specific pools or hosts. Now, if we go to visualizations, we can see some different information. You can also go to a heat map. We can pick specific VMs and pick different um, drill downs for metrics. Then if we go to dashboard and then health, we can see an overview as to the state of our Zen Orchestra install. We can see things like the storage used on our storage repositories, any unhealthy VDIs, uh, VDIs that may exist but do not have a VM that they're attached to, VDIs that are attached to the control domain, Orphan VM snapshots that are snapshots that exist without the VM existing anymore. VMs that may have too many snapshots, which would be a performance problem. VMs that may have duplicate MAC addresses, which would cause networking issues. Any VMs that are missing the guest tools, which would impede things like migration, as well as data collection for things like the IP addresses, as well as any alarms that may be triggered. There are definitely some additional features of Zen Orchestra that I did not touch on in this video. Really designing this to be a quick up and running with XCPNG just to be able to get some VM spun up, some storage, some ISOs, things like that. So there will be a more detailed video coming as far as what Zen Orchestra really has to offer, especially in the realm of backups, remotes managing multiple different pools or pools with different hosts multiple hosts things of that nature so be on the lookout for that next video to come hopefully shortly there may also be some additional context for this video that might be on the blog post so give that a look as well with all that said thanks for taking the time to watch the video i hope to see you in the next one bye for now